Hi everyone and welcome to this 14th episode of the NERVS webinar series on the peace and sustainability nexus in the context of global change. Thank you for taking time to join us today. I am uh, Ayub Sharifi, an associate professor at Hiroshima University and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. If this is uh, your first time joining us, the Network for Educational Research and Peace and Sustainability NERVS is an international network of educators, researchers, and practitioners collaborating towards the advancement of peaceful and sustainable societies amidst global challenges. This webinar series is an initiative we have started last year. We envision this initiative to serve as a platform to encourage us to rethink the, uh, our knowledge and practices surrounding the peace sustainability nexus, especially in this time of rapid global transformation. We invite leading experts to share their knowledge with us about emerging topics on peace and sustainability, including sustainable development and ways to achieve the sustainable development goals. Uh, and I also need to mention that this webinar series will culminate with the NERVS conference on peace and sustainability that is scheduled for March uh, 1 to 3 uh, this year. And registration is still possible. We would like to invite all of you to consider joining us. Uh, the theme of uh, today's webinar is the state of climate change research in Africa. And we are honored to have uh, Dr. Yuvet Benimla with us today. So before starting, I just want to share some uh, housekeeping uh, reminders. Uh, the webinar is being recorded and we will share uh, the recorded video through our website and social media following the event. If you have questions or comments, you can type them in the chat box or in the Q&A Q box at the bottom of the screen anytime during the webinar. Please just make sure to uh, mention your name and also affiliation when adding your comments and questions. Uh, so uh, Dr. Yuvet will talk for about 30 minutes, then we will have time for questions and answers. Also, if you'd like to ask your questions directly, uh, please uh, let me know and I will enable your microphone. And now I'd like to uh, briefly introduce Dr. Uh, Iwet Baninla. Uh, Dr. Baninla is a Cameroonian lecturer at the University of Bamenda, Department of Geology, Mining and Environmental Science. She has a BS degree in geography from the University of uh, Yaoundé, uh, Cameroon, an MS in natural sciences with a focus on marine affairs from Xiamen University in China, and also a PhD in environmental science from the University of Chinese uh, Academy of Science in Beijing, in China. She was awarded uh, the Chinese government scholarship from 2013 to 2015, and the World Academy of Sciences uh, Fellowship from 2015 to 19. In 2020, she was specially appointed at Hiroshima University's Graduate School of Humanities and Social Sciences as an assistant professor. And her research interest is in uh, global and regional patterns of sustainable production and consumption of minerals with a focus on the African context. She examines climate change adaptation and mitigation in Africa and its implications for peace and sustainability. So we're happy, uh, we're very happy to uh, have Dr. Benilla with us. Dr. Benilla, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ayu. Thank you, NERVS, for giving me this opportunity. Thank, thank you, everyone who is here today to listen to me. And for those who are listening online, thank you for sparing some time to be here with me. I understand it's very late in certain parts of the world, or it's either very early and you are awake to have a conversation with me. So I'm very grateful. So this talk is going to be outlined in three parts. The first part, I'm going to look at the impact of climate change in Africa. Then I'll dive into the state of climate change research in Africa. And then the last part, I'll look at how climate change can be tackled. And at the same time, we build peace. I'm one of those people who boast of having a very good memory. I even say that I remember things that ever happened in my life when I was the age of five. But recently, I don't remember ever coming across the concept of global warming when I was in high school. 
But I do remember coming across this concept, maybe second year of my university or third year. And I remember studying so hard because I speculated that the lecturer was going to set a question from that course. I don't remember ever noticing the impact of that course around my immediate surrounding. So one day I picked up my son from school and he said, mom, today was very hot. I was perspiring and I took off my shirt. And in my mind, I'm like, perspiring? Where did he get this word from? Does the credit go to me or to the teachers? And then he comes again, mom, did you hear me? And then I said, yeah, I got you. It was super hot. And then my son said, global warming is coming. At five, he knows about global warming. When I was in high school, I didn't even know about this concept. If you're listening to me today and you grew up in the continent where I grew up, and if you came across the concept of climate change in your high school, then you're probably younger than me. If you never came across this concept in your high school, you will be probably far much older than me. Climate change is a threat to humanity. With carbon dioxide emissions rapidly increasing across the world, thereby directly and indirectly causing an increase in temperature. Greenhouse gas emissions have been rising globally, despite the intervention of a wide array of multilateral institutions with a varying level of ambition. The world has been experiencing rising temperatures over the past 40 years. The past six years have been the warmest, 2016 and 2020. Accordingly, Africa is expected to be hit hardest by the effects of global warming. The Economist Intelligence Unit in 2020 projected that why the global economy may lose close to 3% of its GDP, Africa will be losing 4.7. According to the African Climate Policy Center, the impact will be heterogeneous according to regions, climate regions, and temperature projections. At the global level, the amount of environmental pollution is increasing in absolute terms. Growth in emissions were relatively low in the mid in the 20th century. By 1919, these emissions have quadrupled, reaching more than 22 billion. And we now emit 34 billion each year, growing at an average rate of 1.4%. The question is, where does Africa future in this global emission context? The emissions in Africa are rising gently, but still very slow and varies across regions and countries. In the last two decades, the growth in emissions have averaged 2.6%, while the global emissions are falling to 1.3%. This delta tells us that the environmental pollution in Africa is increasing at an increasing rate than the global, than the global rate. The share of Africa's CO2 emissions in global emissions have been increasing. The share increased. The share was 3.1% between 1980 and 2000. And by 2001 to 2015, the share has surged to 3.6. South Africa is the most polluting country having emitted 451 million tons in 2020. The second emitter is Egypt with 213 million still in 2020. Third, Algeria, 160. Nigeria, 125. Morocco, 60. Libya, 50. All statistics of 2020. Emissions for Sub-Saharan Africa have also surged from 2.3 to 3.7 million tons at an average rate of 1.7. The greatest increases from 1990 to 2018 are recorded in Ghana with 
than interest rate of 8%, Burundi, an interest rate of 4%, Gambia, an interest rate of 1.8%. However, some countries are showing decreasing trend. For instance, there is a decreasing trend for Equatorial Guinea at 5%, Sao Tome and Principe at 4%, Seychelles at 3%. In, 20, in 2019, the Carbon Brief published an article, and in that article they said, Africa's tropical land emitted 60 billion tons of carbon dioxide in 2016. If Africa's tropical land were there for a country, it will mean that there will be the second highest emitter in the world ahead of USA that emitted ahead of USA that emitted 5.3 billion tons in that 2016. The high rate of this emission loss in 2020 could be associated with strong El Nino, which can, use, which can cause an unusual high temperatures and droughts. However, we cannot rule out the substantial changes, land change use that are occurring in Africa. The drivers of global carbon dioxide emissions are energy and agriculture, forestry, and other land use. Of these two main drivers, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, it's again segmented into three sectors, agriculture, industry, and waste. The energy sector has been the major contributor with its share of emissions increasing from 66% to 73% in 2016. Of the other sectors, industry and waste have relatively low increases, but however, the industrial processes have increased significantly, doubling its share from 3% in, in 1990 to 6% in 2016. Over the same period, the agriculture, forestry, and other land use, use sectors have decreased significantly, falling from 27% in 1990 to 16% in 2006, to 18% in 2016. We then looked at the drivers of CO2 emissions in Africa. And you will, and will notice that the main driver for emission in Africa is agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector. Africa accounts for only two to three percent of the world's carbon dioxide emissions from the energy and industrial sector, while the agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector represent 56%. However, a significant difference exists between the Northern Africa and the Sub-Saharan Africa. The North contributes with small negative balance that is more sequestration than emission, while the South emits more, with a majority of its emission at 56%. The good part is that a relative contribution has decreased from 7 to 1% for this agriculture, forestry, and other land use sector to 56%. And this is thanks to land use change and forestry activities. Climate change and climate variability have the potential to exacerbate existing threats to human security in Africa. Without action, Africa's average temperature will increase from 1.5 degree to 3 degrees centigrade by 2050. Warming will be larger than global anomaly warming throughout the continent. As temperature continue to increase, malaria will risk the life of 60 million Africans. The malaria, the malaria hotspots, which are currently in West Africa are going to shift to Central Africa by 2050 and to the Horn of Africa by 2080. The Ebovirus rich hotspots, which are present, which are currently in West Africa, are going to expand throughout Sub-Saharan Africa. Global warming is also projected to have an impact on Africa's GDP. According to the International Monetary Fund, at 
obvious consequences of climate change are concentrated in regions with relatively hot climates. And these are regions with a large number of countries having a low income. The African Climate Policy Center projects that. The gross domestic product in the five sub-African regions will suffer a significant decrease as a result of global warming. For scenarios ranging from one degree centigrade to four degrees centigrade, the continent is going to lose 2.25% 2 of its GDP to 12.12% of its GDP. West Africa, Central Africa, and East Africa are going to have the most significant impact than the North and Southern Africa. Over the period 1995 to 2016, the warm, the warm tropical moist region experienced the most significant increase in temperature and recorded the least growth in GDP. The subtropical moist with the slightest increase in temperature increase was not the region with the highest increase in GDP. The tropical moist, which recorded the highest GDP increase, has a, had a sizable change in temperature. The subtropical moist, the tropical moist, the tropical dry, all documented a high CO2 emissions while at the same time registering a high GDP growth. This could be as a result of their, of their energy consumption. And also this tells us that the economic activities of this country correlates with their CO2 emissions. This tells us also, reveals to us the heterogeneous impacts of global warming across African regions and reveals to us that, that for global warming to be cut down significantly, policies should aim at country level and not at the global level. Climate change is also projected to leave Africa with environmental refugees. In, in 1995, there were 25 million environmental refugees. Of this 25 million, 5 million were in sub in Sahel region, 7 million in sub-Saharan Africa, and 4 million in the Horn of Africa. Migration, particularly secular mobility, is a traditional coping mechanism in the region, representing a livelihood diversification strategy. In 2100, in 2010, the global environmental refugee has increased to 50 million. And of this 50 million, 14 million were in Africa. In 2000, Sudan had about 8 million environmental refugees. Somalia had six, Kenya had three. The main destinations for these environmental refugees are usually within sub-Saharan Africa, North Africa, and Europe. It has been projected that by 2050, the environmental refugees in sub-Saharan Africa will be 200 million. Based on this projection, it can be said that the issue of environmental refugee in sub-Saharan Africa is of great pertinence. Sub-Saharan Africa remains a region to watch with respect to global environmental refugee. Climate change is also going to have an impact in Africa's rainfall. In the medium warming scenario, rainfall is going to increase in Equatorial Guinea, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and decrease in Guinea-Bissau, Zimbabwe, Botswana, and Swaziland. In a high warming scenario, rainfall is going to increase in Guinea-Bissau, Sierra Leone, Ghana, Cameroon, Nigeria, Gabon, and decrease in no other country. While in a low warming scenario, rainfall is going to increase in Equatorial Guinea and decrease in Ethiopia, 
Eritrea. Under a medium warming scenario, decreases in rainfall will be located in the southern, in the southern part of Africa. Climate change is going to reduce Africa's yield by 22%, and the countries that will be most affected will be Tanzania, Malawi, the Sahel region, South Africa, and Zimbabwe. By 2050, 2%, there will be a 2% loss in sorghum, 35% in wheat, and 40% in, in maize. By 2100, Africa's yield reduction will be up to 50%, and a fall in crop revenue will be up to 90%. There will also be losses in the agricultural sector, with the sub Saharan agricultural sector having a loss of 7%. West and Central Africa will have a loss of 4%, and South Africa will have a loss of 1%. If those impacts scared you the way they did to me, then there is good news. The good news is that there are adaptation and mitigation strategies ongoing in Africa. So we then developed our aims to carry out a study. And our first aim was to reveal the emerging development paths that each thematic cluster represents and the strategic principles they embody. Our second study aim was to map the clusters of thematically related publications, the authors, the universities, the countries. And the last aim was to visualize the network of publications. While my team were, was looking at all these three aims, I had a personal objective. I was curious to know why I never came across the concept of global warming in high school and why my son at the age of five could already know about this concept. So we collected the uh, journal data from Science Citation Index, Social Science Citation Index, Science Citation Expanded from the Web of Science, and we used Voss Viewer. We developed our search and we inputted our search and we returned three 4,319 articles. After screening, we were left with 3,235 articles. And here we go. You see from this chart that from 1990 to 2005, to 2007, sorry, Africa had about 118 publications. And from 2008 to 2014, there was a rapid growth and it had about 683 articles published on climate change adaptation and mitigation. From 2015 to 2019, you can see an explosive growth with total number of articles at 1,514. And in less than a year, they are already 947 articles. Maybe, or not even maybe, the truth is the fourth IPPC assessment report that was released in 2007 helped in increasing the number of publications this year. And the fifth IPPC assessment report was also a game changer. Of these articles, 72% are on adaptation, 22% on mitigation, while 6% are on adaptation and mitigation. We were interested in knowing the countries that are making significant contribution to these publications. And America had published 719 articles. In South America, Brazil was leading. In Asia, China was making a significant contribution. In Europe, we had Germany making a significant contribution. While in Africa, South Africa was making significant contribution, followed by Ethiopia. Then you have Tanzania, you have uh, Ghana, Nigeria, and Cameroon. 
we wanted to know how many of the case studies have been happening in different countries in the continent. And from this map, you will notice that more case studies have happened in South Africa than any other country in the continent, having registered 380 case studies. Ethiopia is second with 301 case studies. Then you have Ghana with 200 and 242 case studies. Then you have Nigeria coming up with a good with a number of case studies as well. Sorry. Of the 54 African countries, 11% have not done any case study on climate change and mitigation. 64% have carried less than 100 case studies on climate change and mitigation, while 9.2% have carried more than 100 case studies on climate change and mitigation. And from this same map, you see that there are still a number of countries without a publication on climate change adaptation and mitigation. For the countries with who are giving significant, uh, bringing significant contribution, we were interested in knowing their research focus. And then we also look at the thematic cluster from 1990 to 2007. And from the uh, slide in front of you, you're going to see four different clusters, the blue, the red, the yellow and the green. The blue cluster highlights the vulnerability of households and farmers due to climate change variability and the poverty it has inflicted on communities. The, the, from the blue cluster, it is visible that researchers are interested in studying adaptation from the gender, household, indigenous perspective which scientists consider as an important factor of vulnerability. The red cluster, the red cluster showcases a drive by researchers to understand the general impact of climate change on food security. Most of the research is on the impact of climate change on agriculture and its contribution to food security. The next concern for this cluster is the types of agricultural approaches used to increase food security. And from there, you can see that there are studies on conservation agriculture, as well as studies on uh, climate smart agriculture. The green cluster is centered around the concept of climate change mitigation, that is forest management and mitigation. A considerable amount of research has been done on carbon sequestration in this cluster. And the last, that's the yellow cluster, it's mainly on sustainability and energy related climate change mitigation. And there you see a link between institutions and policy suggesting that, suggesting that they are exploring the climate policy designs and institutions involved despite the significance of mitigation policies, relative research has been done on this cluster. Now we dive into the different, we dive into the different, into the different thematic, uh, thematic sectors to see the transitions over time. And from 2000 and and from 1990 to 2007, you can see that the research focus here was still very, very low. And maybe that answers my question. That is why in my high school, I could not come across the concept of global warming because research focus here was still very, very low. Now the second period, you see a rapid growth in the second period. Could this be the time that my son came across this, this public, that came across the concept of global warming? I think not, because if he was born in 2011, 
by then he's still too small to know about this concept. And you also see from this concept that the publications are not also that too many for a little boy like him to have come across the concept. And then you have the 2015 to, 2000 and, to 2020 to 2019. And that's when my son, growing up in a continent like Africa, came across this concept because research has expanded and we now observed an explosive growth. And also the birth of a new yellow cluster, which we didn't have in the previous period. And the post pandemic, you see from the post pandemic, the yellow cluster disappears and merges with the blue cluster. And then researches on energy, renewable energy continues. The outset of the pandemic has had a positive impact on climate research in the continent. As we can see, new ideas have been developed and then there's a rise in publication. Unfortunately, the ending lockdowns have drawn attention away from climate change policy, nationally and internationally. The question is, why has there not been a pandemic preparedness for climate change as it has been for, for, for climate change as it has been for COVID pandemic? And then we wanted to know the influential journals that were behind this focus. And you see from the, blue, from the blue cluster, the Global Environmental Journal is an influential source. PINAS is another influential source. Science, another. Nature, another influential source. We wanted to know the universities in Africa that were making significant contribution. And from the table in front of you, you see that universities in South Africa are making significant contributions than any other university. We also have universities from Ethiopia, Ghana, and Tanzania. We looked at these different countries that were making significant contribution, and we wanted to know their research focus. And you can see that South Africa, Botswana and Tanzania are some of the African countries with a close collaboration on adaptation, while Kenya, Cameroon, Ghana, and Nigeria have some research interest on food security. Ethiopia, Morocco, Egypt, Tunisia, and Algeria are some of the countries interested in mitigation research, and Zambia in energy-related issues. We also looked at the international organizations that were behind these this publications. And we have the World Agri Agroforestry, which has already published 64 articles with its headquarters in Kenya. The Center for International Forestry Research in Indonesia, it's another international contribu contribution uh, organization. We looked at international universities that were also behind these publications. And we noticed that Many universities from Europe and America were making significant contribution. What are our key findings? The volume of information on climate change adaptation and mitigation has not gained a vast scope in Africa. Priority research topics and themes have been dynamic over time with some core concepts like vulnerability, food, water, and energy security. Although the number of published articles exhibited a rapidly growing trend, their distribution is extremely uneven. Researchers have examined not all African countries. We therefore suggest that there should be an assessment of climate change risks and measures on African countries. And the last part of, our, of my presentation is how can we tackle climate change and at the same time build peace. In sub-Saharan Africa, many countries are economically dependent on the agricultural sector, 
As such, negative environmental shocks will reduce agricultural output, which, leads, which will lead to a fall in income and thus the opportunity cost of conflict participation. Looking at the Global Peace Index, use the shades of green shows increasing index, which shows low peacefulness. And you will see that these shades of green are mostly concentrated in Africa than in other parts of than in other parts of the world. Most of the low income countries in tropical areas are exposed and vulnerable to climate change. And these countries are also prone to fragility due to insecurity and conflict. Globally, 355 million households are exposed to climate hazards and are thus in need of climate change adaptation. 40% of those are in conflict prone and fragile prone areas. The greatest opportunities to align adaptation and peace building objectives exist in Nigeria and Ethiopia. These countries have global peace index values ranging from 2.4 to 3.4. And the number of climate exposed households are in the range of 2 million to 11 million. DRC, Sudan, Niger, Zimbabwe, and Chad show substantial opportunities to address both climate adaptation and peace building. We Global peace index values above 2.4%, but their potential beneficiaries are very low, between 1 million to 2 million households per country. What are some of the actions that are being taken in the continent to build peace and tackle climate change at the same time? The West African Network for Peace Building in Nigeria began to engage with the national and state government on agriculture and climate resilience to support small scale farmers. The voice in the vision for Africa in Zimbabwe holds engagement platform for community and national stakeholders to address the issue of climate change through a series of policy briefings. The Global Partnership for the Prevention of Armed Conflict Members in Zimbabwe is also doing a very good job. The Center for Conflict uh, resolution in Uganda, it's also another organization that is at the same time tackling climate change and building peace. And then the food and agricultural organization projects that are scattered all over the continent are doing another good job. Climate finance should be leveraged in a way that maximizes synergies if we want to build peace and at the same time tackle climate change. Adaptation investment should target countries at substantial risks of climate-driven instability and conflict. Currently, adaptation investment insufficiently target countries at substantial risks of climate-driven instability and conflict. Only two out of the 10 top global recipients of adaptation finance are in Africa, that's Niger and Ethiopia. For us to do this, we, for us to tackle climate change and achieve peace, conflict prevention and peace building objectives need to future in adaptation program, programming. The use of conflict sensitive approach to adaptation might also avoid an outbreak. Before I step down, I wanna leave us with a question. How can the impact of climate change pose a less significant threat to peace in Africa? Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Vanilla, for the very insightful presentation. A lot of information was presented here and I think this will be a good opportunity to also hear some questions and answers from the floor. So uh, if, if there are any questions and answers, please uh, just feel free to share your thoughts. So while waiting for comments from other colleagues, uh, I was just uh, 
wondering about the share of work done on mitigation. I see that the majority of work is on uh, adaptation and it makes sense considering that uh, Africa is responsible for only about 2% of uh, global emissions. From the energy sector. From the energy sector. But uh, as you uh, clearly showed, considering the changes in population trends, uh, especially because we're expecting that countries like Nigeria will be uh, those that are expected to experience significant uh, urbanization trends and also significant population changes, population increases. So it is very likely that in a few decades, Africa will be a main contributor to global energy related emissions. Uh, do you have any like uh, insights on what could be done to further promote climate change mitigation related research in Africa as well, in addition to adaptation? Thank you, Ayu, for the, for the question. Uh, what I think for the, what should be done for the mitigation sector in Africa, it's like um, there's this need for the promotion of renewable energies, which I see it happening, but it's still very slow. Because if you see the emissions from the energy sector, though at 2% will continue to rise if we don't change our energy consumption, our energy consumption sources. So if we shift to renewable energies, and you could, if you could see from this slide, there are already studies on renewable energy coming up, meaning that there's already the utilization of this renewable energy in the continent. And I believe we have the potentials for the renewable energies. We have the sun. We have the wind. So if we could just take a shift towards this, then there will be a less emission from the energy sector and other environmental issues will be solved as well. Thank you very much. We have uh, one question from Evelyn Musonda. Apologies if I mis mispronounce your name. Uh, the question is that, do you think lack of funding and social science research has contributed to why many countries in Africa are not conducting a lot of research in this area? Thank you, Evelyn, for your question. I will say that this in part could have contributed, but I also want to say that we don't take the issue of climate change seriously in the continent, because like I said, people are not experiencing the impact, the immediate impact. So people are not taking it seriously. Like when I was growing, remember my story? I never knew about the impact of climate change. Now people are, start, are starting to know about the impact of this climate change, but how many people are feeling this impact in their surrounding environments? Funding, when you know about an impact, then you begin to seek funding to tackle that impact. So if we don't really witness or feel the impact of this change around us, it's hard for us to forward our researches towards this direction. Hope I answered your question. I think that was a very comprehensive answer. So related to that, uh, I think Dalia also has a question. So uh, related to that, uh, I think the impacts are quite tangible in many parts, especially for instance, if you consider this issue of uh, environmental migration, for instance. How do you think the role of uh, communication systems has been? Maybe there, there is a lack of good communication of the impacts to the public so that uh, they become more aware of uh, the issue and call for more action. Do, do you think there is enough like communication, uh, like climate change communication to the public in the continent? Um, like we saw from the slides, it's changing. At the, at before, there was not enough communication, but as time goes on, communication is being improved. And that's why you could see the different studies that are coming up. I think now in Africa, if you could gather a group of farmers you will get a lot of impacts from them. They will tell you how in 2000, they used to harvest such amounts of crops, but now they can seldom harvest this quantity of crops. So slowly the communication has improved, 
and people now see the impact of this global of the global warming like you have floods everywhere every month you have floods in different parts of the different parts of the country crop yields are reducing and farmers are seeing are seeing this so communication is already it's being improved thank you Talia. so we have a question from uh... Uh, Mr. Kazungu is a student uh, at Hiroshima University. He, he is interested about uh, the issue of climate education. So the question is, is there a window to include uh, mitigation adaptation research in the school curriculum? And at what level will such knowledge be palatable, secondary or tertiary? Or uh, So any, any ideas on that? Thank you, Kazungu, for your question. I will still go back to my story. I think now global warming is being incorporated into the school curriculum in Africa because at the age of five, my son already knew about global warming. While me in high school never knew about this global warming. So it's being incorporated at, uh, and it depends on the system of education too. There are certain curriculums that already at the nursery school, will tell the kids about global warming and how you can feel the impact around you. In high school, lots of courses are being done on global warming. At the university level, it's also being carried out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, um, Dr. Benina, for your presentation. Maybe this is a little bit related to what you asked uh, earlier. You shared with us some of the examples of organizations that are working on peace building and conflict resolution in Africa. I'm just curious if you have initial observations on how um, these organizations are being informed by the current research on climate change in Africa, if there is a partnership between you know, research and practice, which is usually not the thing in many other uh, research teams. Thank you. Come again, what was your question? We got distracted, <laughs> yeah. sorry. <laughs> if there is an existing partnership uh, between research and um, practice in Africa, uh, for example, the organizations that you shared earlier, are they being informed by the state of climate change research in Africa? Is their work being informed by research? Thank you. Thank you, Dalia, for your question. Yes. I would say yes, they are being informed because if you look at the organization that I choose to present, their work is mainly to tackle climate change and at the same time build peace. So they are well informed and there are collaboration with climate change organization like the Climate Green Fund. You see, at the Food and Agricultural Organization comes into, at the same time, is trying to raise the food productivity like providing certain crop yields that can be uh, cultivated and at the same time building peace. So there is collaboration. Thank you. Uh, we have. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a question for. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah. Please introduce yourself first. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm Yumea. I'm from Hiroshima University. And uh, I think in your presentation, you listed South Africa as one of the countries that uh, will be most affected by climate change. And um, South Africa is also the country that is leading research uh, on the continent regarding climate change. And I wondered if there was a connection, like uh, if in South Africa there is um, general awareness of the problem and um, if there are actually taken measurements of government and universities to tackle climate change. Thank you, Yona, for your question. Yes, they are leading in the in the research, in the they are leading in the continent when it comes to climate change research. And that tells you that they are aware. So for the other countries that have little or no research, it tells you that they are not aware of this impact or they are not aware they're not fully aware of the impact, so there is no need for studies to, to go on. And may I also add to that, this is probably also an issue of institutional capacity. I think compared to some other African countries, probably there is more institutional capacity there. Do you see that 
that might be also a contributing factor. Yeah, that's a that's a contributing factor. Mm. Um, how is South Africa and, uh, in development at um, renewable resources, uh, renewable energy? Are there, are there um, like energy is a problem, is a huge problem with emissions? And I wondered if they are uh, working on the topic, if they are also um, high up in developing new renewable energy. Yes, they are, and I think they are the first leading country with renewable energies. Most of the countries in Southern Africa, South Africa, Tanzania, Mozambique, they are leading in renewable energy resource, with renewable energy use. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. We have some more questions. Uh, Kian Zhang uh, wants to know, this is a question. Besides climate change challenges, what are other SDGs you think are important and closely related to the desired progress of climate change in Africa? So uh, in addition to these challenges, so I assume what you presented is mainly focused on SDG 13, which is on climate action. But uh, I think uh, we also have other SDGs uh, 16 others. So what other SDGs should do you think should be prioritized in Africa? So I think we don't have the full list of SDGs here, but for instance, we have poverty, we have uh, education, gender equality, peace, uh, institutions, cities, energy, water, uh, land, and some others. So what kind of, what, what among those, what do you think are other urgent issues? I think uh, in a way, probably these are quite interrelated, but if you think some of them should be prioritized, I don't know hear that. Um, because I don't have the list of the four SDGs with me, with me here, so I'll just speak from my personal, personal experience. I think poverty should be prioritized, prioritized. But again, it will make no sense alleviating poverty when you cannot have drinkable water to drink. Yeah, exactly. These yeah. are quite so interrelated. It's, it's, it's quite inter, uh, it's, it's, linked, it's linked together. So I don't think one is more important, more important than the other. Yeah, I, I fully agree. Thank you. We have other questions. Uh, Christina Muyumbe. Uh, from Ter Congo, uh, she thanks you for the wonderful presentation. Uh, the results you shared from bibliometric analysis provide the basis for better understanding the situation in Africa and prediction of future research on this area. Are there any efforts from African researchers to come up with solutions due to lack of funding? Um, thank you for your question. For now, I don't really know about, about that. I'm not very informed about the, the, the sources of funding and if African researchers are doing something to come up, to come up with, uh, with funding. I'm sorry, I cannot really give mm -hmm. an appropriate answer to that. That's fine. Uh, next question is from Hassan Whitefield. African countries are not responding to climate change threats in ways that simultaneously reduce social inequalities. What could be th three elements that could be directed associated with this menace? How to uh, also make sure that climate change research also tackles uh, the issues related to social inequality? Um. I think it will still go with the same thing, like what are some of the ways that we can tackle climate change and at the same time build peace? So the question, if I understand well, is how can we tackle climate change and reduce inequality, right? That's the question. How can we tackle climate change and reduce inequality? Now you see that these are two different sectors, climate change, and then inequality. 
So for us to tackle climate change at the same time build inequality, we have to first of all involve all the stakeholders. All the stakeholders should come together. And then when we understand the issues of different stakeholders, we will then know how climate change can be tackled and then how we can reduce inequality. Yeah, thank you. Uh, another question is about the challenges that we may uh, perceive. What do you think might be major challenges towards uh, achieving climate change mitigation and adaptation in Africa? Um, I would say that the main challenge in achieving mitigation and adaptation in Africa is uh, to reduce the CO2 emissions. There are a lot of land activities that need to be changed. And for Africa to change this land activity, Activities, it's a little bit hard because that's we depend on agriculture. And agriculture provides more than 80% of employment in the continent. So, and it's and as you saw from my slide, it's the agricultural sector that emits more energy. So for us to mitigate, we'll have to tackle the agricultural sector and also reduce our deforestation rate. Thank you. Uh, another question from Mercy Mushani from Hiroshima University. Uh, she, the presenter mentioned some African countries are recording a decrease in CO2 emissions. What could be the reason for this reduction? So she wants to know uh, those reasons and probably those reasons also can help others lesson, learn some lessons to reduce their emissions as well. Thank you for your question. I think the the main reason is their way of activities, especially when you look at their agricultural activities. So they've, I, they've, they're shifting their agricultural activities, doing less deforestation and more afforestation. So this is why you can see a decrease. A country like uh, Seychelles, that's an island. It's easy for them, you see, like they have reduced, they're planting more trees and not cutting more trees. So this will probably lead to a decrease in their CO2, their CO2 emission. So more climate uh, smart and resilient agriculture is yeah. needed. Thank you. And uh, last but not least, I think we have more questions, but unfortunately we can only take one more. Uh, from Oscar Mwanzi, uh, I am interested in any research around the impact of recent investments in clean energy sources in Kenya. The country has recently gone full lens and wind power, solar projects, and geothermal. Maybe comments on project implementation issues and funding, uh, being counterproductive and other SDGs, uh, donor funding leading to massive debts for the country. So I think this is just a comment. What's your take on that? Thank you for the comment. And I, it's not only Kenya that's taking full light on this renewable energy. Energy. We've noticed many countries, especially the eastern, the eastern region and the southern region that have greatly shifted to renewable energy, which is very good for the continent. And we also see that if other regions follow suit, there's going to be a, there's going to be a huge positive impact for the countries and also for the continent. Thank you very much. So, yeah, I, I think that will be the last question, but just uh, let's just take one more. Uh, plastic pollution has been identified as one of the sources of climate change. Uh, what are African countries doing to reduce plastic consumption? Any uh, bottom-up activities there that you have observed? Mm, um... I think I will speak from the local from the local level. I've noticed that in many African countries, there are organizations like served implemented organizations or self created organizations that are coming up to tackle the problem of plastic by plastic pollution in the continent. I think that's still the first the first step, which is still very very local, where plastics are being raised as being a big being a big environmental a big environmental issue and organizations like local NGOs dealing with environment now 
put on initiatives to gather these plastics and see how it can be recycled. I have a, I've seen a good number of them happening in, a, in Cameroon, where you have many plastic recycling, recycling companies. I want to believe it's happening in other parts as well. I hope so. Thank you very much, Dr. Baninla, for the very insightful presentation, which uh, raised many questions. I uh, expect there will be more questions, but uh, feel free to share your questions with us. Uh, we will pass them to Dr. Benilla. So at the end, on behalf of my colleagues at NERPS, I would like to once again, thank you all for uh, finding time to attend uh, today's uh, webinar. Before closing, I would like to uh, invite you to visit our website at uh, nerps.org and subscribe to also our newsletter for updates and our activities, including the upcoming webinars and also uh, the uh, first NERPS conference that is scheduled for again, March one, two, three this year. And uh, the registration is still possible. So please feel free to visit NERPS website, nerps.org and register. And uh, we hope to see you again in our future webinars and also during the conference. Thank you very much.